So I thought I'd go through some of the rarer theorems and techniques that might be quite useful for Tamura. I'm not going to go through anything that, honestly, I think everyone knows they need to know, like exact values for trig and things like that. Um, but things that, you know, you might not have come across that is actually quite useful. Um, I'll go through them in order of like most common to, to, to really niche and least common things that honestly you don't really see very often at all. The Taylor Swift change of base law is super important. I would say. Um, I think if you're not aware of this, you probably should be. Um, of course, to solve this, we can take a log of both sides of both things. Now, we notice that the answer um, for A, B, we can times these together, but like, what do we do with these bases then if we're timesing these things together? That's kind of the question here. Um, and this change of base law, um, which is uh, log to base A of B is equal to log to base whatever you want, and of course we want Taylor Swift, so we'll put her here, of B, and then divided by log to that same base, this base has to be the same, which is why it's the same picture of her and then A uh, just after this. So to times these logs together, for example, we can say that this here is log to base E, which we can just write as log or LN or however you want to write this like this, and then this log could be written like this. And now we can actually make some progress because all these logs are the same, right? So I'm just applying the Taylor Swift law to these and we should be good, right? Two is, uh, and then we apply some, this is just me doing some actual log laws here because I noticed that these can cancel if you put the three at the front and if you put the five at the front, those can cancel as well. So it works out pretty nicely. Um, cancel, 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 cancel. Three times five is 15. And who knew this uh, whole thing here just turns into 15 uh, via the Taylor Swift change of base law. I would highly recommend that you do go into the tumor exam definitely knowing this rule. Um, it used to be taught in A-level maths as uh, standard, but then when the new calculators came out, I say new, like this was 15 years ago probably, but the, the, the calculators came out that could do this. Um, that can just do any base for you. This law became, you know, archaic and unused in A-level maths, so it's not even discussed anymore. But of course, in a non-calculated paper, it's still a super useful uh, law to know. So yeah, cool. Anyway, uh, that's the first one done. Uh, number two uh, is remainder theorem. Um, I think this is a super useful thing to know. Again, it's A-level maths kind of almost talks about it, but then just doesn't. Um, so you know factor theorem is just f of x equals zero, then Sorry, if f of a equals zero, then x minus a is a factor. Remainder theorem says a very similar thing, which is that um, if f of a is some remainder r, that means x minus a divides with remainder r rather than remainder zero, right? It's a very similar thing. Watch my video on remainder theorem. If you want to see this, I'll put it in the description below if you want to see it more fully. But essentially, this is just asking us here, if we multiply this and this, which I can't even be bothered to multiply, I'm just going to put them next to each other. And we apparently divide by this, the remainder is this. That means when you sub in minus one into this function, you get 24. That's essentially what remainder theorem says. Um, so of course I can just do that. I can put in minus one and we end up solving for P really, really quickly. The whole question, you were supposed to exp actually expand this and then do some polynomial division with X plus one. Of course, this is much, much quicker. So again, I've got a video on this. I, I would suggest this is another thing that you do just want to know. Um, slightly rarer things now, how to find the number of factors of a number. Basically, if the number is in prime factorized form, the total number of factors of this number here is just this power increased by one times by this power increased by one and so on for any other numbers you've got over here. So in this case, 2025 has five times three, which is 15 factors. Um, that ends up being super helpful for this question because if you rewrite this as this and then factorize, uh, because this itself is 2025, because it's just a factorized form of, of this, we're just looking for how many ways can we do something times something else to make 2025. Well, I just said 2025 has 15 factors. So therefore, there's seven things that this can be, seven things that are bigger for this to be. And then you've got the one case where it's 45 times 45 for the same thing twice, which that factor is only count counted once, of course. But this particular question said they were both positive, so we can't have that because B would be zero. Anyway, that means there are seven things um, that, uh, that would actually work here. Another nice uh, useful rule then for areas of squares, rhombuses, or kites, these are the quadrilaterals which have perpendicular diagonals. Um, you can watch my quadrilaterals video if you want to verify that. But if, if, if a quadrilateral has perpendicular diagonals, you can use either one of these two rules. This one for squares because the diagonals happen to be the same length or this one for the other two, where one represents one diagonal and the other the other, uh, for the area. Um, and this is super useful sometimes because, for example, this question here um, is asking us for the area of this shape here, which I know is a rhombus because all of the sides of this shape are hypotenuses of a triangle that's kind of one across and a half down all of these. So I know all these lengths are going to be the same. I'm actually going to call the length of this cube one just to make the maths easy. Um, so, okay, if we, if we do that, then I can say that 
um, I actually, you know, the obvious thing to do is to find this length here. You know, you call this a half maybe because you've called this one and this is one and do some Pythagoras. But that's not my aim because I have these two formulas. My aim is just to find this length and this length. And then because I know it's a form, uh, it's a rhombus, I can use this thing here. So, okay, let's do that. Well, this length here is just triple Pythagoras. It's one squared plus one squared plus one squared. Uh, if you didn't know Pythagoras works in every, in three dimensions, or in fact, in lots more dimensions after that, then great. Probably know that because that can come out super handy. This is definitely root three. And then this length here is obviously the same as this length here, which is just root two by basic Pythagoras. So that's root two, which means the area of this rhombus is a half times root two times root three, which is root six over two. Um, it's actually asked for the ratio of r squared to one of the um, faces. Now, one of the faces of the cube is obviously just like is area one. So I don't really even need this. I just need r squared, which is six over four, which is, of course, three over two. And so we have our answer of three over two. And that's much, much faster than trying to find this angle and doing a half a b sine theta for this triangle and doubling it. It's, it this this formula kind of occasionally quite useful. Um, congruency laws then. So we, we know SSS and SAS and ASA and stuff, but I'm talking about specifically these rules here, which I do have a video for, which I'm going to put in the description as well. You might just want to go into the exam memorizing these rules. Um, because if you get a question like this, which they have asked sort of roughly probably, I would say every other year, it's knowing these rules makes it super easy. For which values of B can distinct triangles that's non-uniqueness be drawn? Well, we're just looking for this one here. Honestly, I couldn't tell you right now where these rules came from there in my video. So please go watch that if you actually care. But otherwise, I can just put these values in here, right? S1 represents B because it's opposite the angle. S2 is 3A. So it's going to be 3A sine 45 less than B less than uh, 3A, right? And uh, sine 45 is obviously this. And so we end up with the answer immediately. So yeah, you could go about memorizing those. Could be super useful. It might come up. It might not, but it might. Symmetry rules then. So if you've got like an equation of a curve, um, how do you know whether it's symmetrical around various things? There's a bunch of rules you can memorize. Um, so here's uh, the first. If, if you can replace y with negative y and the equation is the same, that means it's reflective in the uh, y in the x-axis. So that's what I've used here, right? If you replace that y with negative y, because negative y to the power 4 is still positive y to the power 4, you have made no difference. And likewise here, so this must be symmetrical in the x-axis based on this rule. Likewise, for the y-axis, very similar. If you can replace x with minus x, and get exactly the same thing, then it's reflective in the y-axis. Notice that's why I said this wasn't, because of course, if I replace that with minus x, you get minus x to the nine, so it doesn't work. Um, the other two that you might want to know is if you can replace x with y and vice versa. So if, that, if you can essentially swap the x's and the y's over and it makes no difference, then your line is reflective in y equals x. And if you can swap y with minus x and vice versa, x with minus y, um, then therefore it's reflective in the line y equals minus x. Realistically, those are probably the only ones that will be ever useful for you to know. And also, realistically, they probably won't be that useful for you to know, but they could be, I guess. And the last one I'll discuss very quickly is inverse Pythagorean theorem, which could help, I guess. Um, it's also just a bit of a, a flex, um, I guess, as well. I have, a, I have a soft spot for it. This is a question from some old Tamura paper um, where it's given you some information that looks a bit like this if you draw it. And I can instantly answer this question because essentially they're giving me the, they're asking me for this length, but but like I know this length is twenty and I know this length is twelve. Inverse Pythagorean says that if you have the what's called the altitude of the triangle here h, then you can just relate a, b, and h together with this formula rather than the usual Pythagorean theorem which relates the other three sides. So we can just say, well, the thing that I want, which we'll just call y, I guess, um, is going to be one over y squared plus 1 over 20 squared equals 1 over 12 squared like this. And we can go about solving this, right? Um, so this is just bring numbers in, I guess. Um, here, do some prime number tricks, I guess, to put these together, because I know that is 12 squared, which is 2 squared times 3, 4 squared. That's 2 squared times, sorry, that's 2 to the 4 times 3 squared. This here is obviously 2 squared times 100, which then becomes 2 to the 4 times 5 squared. And now I can see that I just need to give this one two more fives and this one two more threes to make them match. So this book, this will become a 25 over whatever this is times by 9, which is 3,600, minus this one times by 9, because it needs the three squares over the same thing. And now we can simplify this without too much pain, um, do some cancelling down. I'm uh, sorry, square rooting, I've done that. And then we can flip over and we get 15 as the answer. Could occasionally become helpful there. I might make a video with some more rules in it in case uh, we find any that are useful.